Hey. Hello. How are you? Good. Calling Chris Anderson in, in another <laughs> anonymous hotel room. Are you in the witness protection program? I am. I said to feel that way. Yeah, I know. Um, not that you know it, but I'm in Lyon. It's ah. Tuesday. It must be Lyon. Yeah. Ah, fantastic. How is Operation Dragoon going? Operation Dragoon is fantastic. Uh, seen lots of really incredible sites and got to see some great French resistance sites today. And uh, it's all really cool. Uh, a little tired of hotel rooms, if I'm honest. But, well, uh, fantastic. Lyon is great. Yeah. Can't wait for that tour to be offered, everybody. Welcome to History Happy Hour, brought to you by, uh, with the help and assistance of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours, who offer a variety of history tours. Chris, where? In, in America, Europe, and Asia. And Asia, yes. Have and, we left uh, anything out? I mean, I'm sure there's more to follow, but... Uh, maybe more continents. We need... Yeah. Uh, what, what kind of war <laughs> stuff happened in Antarctica? I've there we go, to, uh, yeah. Uh, and you can check out that uh, uh, the tour company at stephenambrosetours.com. And whether you're watching live, watching on replay, or listening on the HHH podcast. podcast. Thank you for joining us today. It's going to be an encore episode of a show we did several months ago on Hessians in the American Revolution. But, um, but, but tied very closely to the show we had last week. To the show we had last week where they discovered, I think, 15 Hessians at, uh, at yeah. Red Bank. And... Uh, you know, we probably should know more about Hessians, and Frederica Baer is going to tell us more because she has done a whole lot of research about it. Absolutely one of our favorite interviews of last year. Yeah, so let us know that you're here and, of course, what you're drinking, where you are, um, you know, passwords, any other information you want to share. <laughs> uh, thanks to everybody who supports us via Patreon, and I want to give a special shout-out to our Top Shelf patrons. Uh, and you can become a patron, sorry. a Top Shelf patron, you can set your own level of patronage um, at patreon.com slash history happy hour. Um, so, Chris, I imagine, you know, I, I, got, I do have to say just one other thing as people are joining us here, that, that the reason that we're not here in person this week. What is that reason, Rick? Yes. The reason is, what is that reason? because it is NASCAR weekend in oh. Chicago and they have blocked off the roads. They're in the process of being blocked off yeah. about a quarter of a mile from here to create a downtown Chicago street race course that 100,000 right. people are going to come into town and watch 40 or 50 race cars go zipping around at but, high but, volume. But isn't History Happy Hour like, performed in a studio many floors up? You know, I, 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 I <laughs> yes, but it's, it's, it's still too close. It's still too close. I did check, you know, the favorites this weekend are Chase Elliott, Tyler Reddick, Kyle Lanson, and... Martin Truex Jr. So if you want to put a little money any place uh, on the race, you know that's, so that's are where you, I, I are you recommend. Renting, are you renting out your apartment then? You... Uh, you know, my wife is staying. Uh, no, my wife's coming with me. No, no oh, we're not renting okay. out the apartment. Uh, we're we're going to blockade it against all those NASCAR um, hooligans oh, uh, NASCAR who might be coming to town. Mm. Um, okay, so do you think we have killed enough time here? I, I, I certainly think yeah, so, yeah. Steve, Please, <laughs> God, let's get to the show. Give me a cue. Uh -huh. The bar is open. The bar is open. And, Chris, what's on tap? Yeah, um... Well, I'm really excited about this uh, book about the Hessians. We're being joined uh, by Frederica Baer, and she is the Associate Professor of History in the Division's Head for Arts and Humanities at Pennsylvania State University. Uh, her research focuses on the experiences of German-speaking people in North America, uh, and her publications include The Trial of Friedrich Eberl, uh, Language, Patriotism, and Citizenship in Philadelphia's German Community from 1790 and 1830. But mo more importantly, she has just come out with this great new book, Hessians, German Soldiers in the American Revolutionary War. So, Frederica, thank you for joining us. Hi, so happy to be here. Good, thank you. So, Frederica, I'm going to get, get kind of right in because I know we're a bit pressed, but um, back in July 1776, there's a group of men uh, and they've gotten together and they're just whining a, a lot about things that they just they're complaining <laughs> we're, about. We're, we're, we're right away, we're getting right, into right into okay. it. But uh, as they're drafting what becomes the Declaration of Independence, they have a list of grievances about why King George is no longer fit to be king. And he says, amongst other things, 
that he is at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy scarcely parallel in the most barbarous ages and totally unworthy the head of the head of a civilized nation. So that tends to be the impression that's been passed down uh, of Hessians. What little people know is that they're just evil mercenaries sent to wreak destruction. Um, how much, wh wh where does this kind of false narrative come from? I know at the time, how does it sustain itself for so long? Because obviously in this book, you paint a much different picture. Yeah, that's a that's an, a good question. I think that um, as your as the the light from the Declaration of Independence indicates, the uh, patriots were essentially using uh, the king's decision to hire foreigners, specifically Germans, in the war in the war against its his own subjects, um, as a tool really to um, support independence and ultimately to um, you know encourage colonists to resist against um, this oppression. Right. And so the um, the patriots very intentionally, actively um, painted a picture of these German soldiers as mercenaries, as cruel, as being hired by the king really to do his dirty work. And they started doing that before the first German soldiers set foot on American so soil. So it was part of, I would say, their propaganda, really, um, real, before the, the, first Amer the, the first Germans even arrived. And then it continues. This narrative continues, especially through the fall of 76. Mm -hmm. It gets changed somewhat after Trenton, but um, it's really remained with us. I mean, the reference, is, mm -hmm. the reference to the Germans as mercenary, which is it's not the correct label, is, is very telling. Mercenaries, yeah. you know, this idea that individuals kind of going to war for for power out of greed for personal gain yeah. so it really doesn't describe them accurately but that's the image that's been with us since 76 yeah so about 30,000 soldiers from Germany under their own officers and commanders are uh, fighting with the British Army in North America mm -hmm. who are they and why did the British choose to rely so strongly on these, uh, I'll use a phrase that you used, these rental armies for this war? <laughs> yeah, so it, it becomes very clear early on, um, already in 75, basically, that the British do not have enough soldiers in North America to put down the rebellion. It also is pretty clear early on that the, the British will not be able to raise a sufficient number of troops in England or other parts of the empire. So they're doing what they've done uh, for about a century already, uh, namely turn to foreign rulers to hire soldiers. So this is nothing new. Um, this is something that uh, Britain had done before. And the German uh, territories, for the most part, that enter into these agreements had already done this in the past as well. So the practice was generally accepted throughout Europe. Um, they go to, uh, in the fall of 76, um, the king sends an emissary to various uh, German courts. We should, of course, I guess, remind everyone that Germany does not exist as a nation. Um, the Holy Roman Empire is uh, divided into hundreds of small territories, mostly German speaking. And the six territories that ultimately decide to hire out soldiers are part of the Holy Roman Empire. A couple of these rulers had already offered troops um, that as soon as they knew oh, there's a war going on, they're going to be asking, they already offered troops. Um, so the emissary, his name is William Fawcett, and he goes first to Braunschweig, then to Kassel and other territories and negotiates for soldiers. Um, and uh, ultimately, it, it, as I mentioned, it's six territories. Um, Hessen Kassel um, rented out approximately 20,000 troops. Hessen Hanau, at the time ruled by the hereditary Prince of Hessen, rented out uh, perhaps 2,500. Um, the others come from Braunschweig, Wolfenbüttel, Anhalt Zerbst, um, Waldeck, and um, Ansbach Bayreuth. Um, so the range, the, the, the numbers vary widely 1,200 total or so from Waldeck to 20,000 plus from Hessen Kassel. And because the, so many came from Hessen, they're collectively known as Hessians although they're really coming from all kinds of different places throughout the Holy Roman Empire. 
So it is really the king needs soldiers, and this seemed to be a convenient way to get uh, trained, outfitted men across the Atlantic quickly in time for a first campaign in the summer of 76. So, so Frederick, one of the things that I found really interesting in the book um, that I'd like you to kind of expand on is your definition, or, or I shouldn't say your definition, the definition at the time of what a mercenary was, right? I mean, because you make the very interesting point that there are a lot more mercenaries involved in the war and the, the people think. Yeah, I... Uh, I, I to keep in mind about these auxiliary troops, that's really what they're, they're called, that would be a better name for them. They are hired out um, by their rulers um, on, as you already mentioned, these are these, essentially the, the king enters into an agreement with, say, the Duke of Braunschweig and says, I want, you know, 5,000 infantry or whatever it was, so many regiments, equipment and all of that. And then the ruler is responsible for raising these troops. Uh, and renting them out as units with, as you already suggested, their own commanders and so forth. So that's very different from an individual soldier kind of signing up on, on his own um, to serve in, a, in the British Army, for example. There were some of them, and, and, and some, of you, some of you may, I mentioned this, I think, briefly in the book, the so-called Scheiter recruits. Yeah. Um, there were military contractors out there that tried to, for personal gain, literally raised troops, they got money, the kind of a commission for it, and there were maybe up to 2,000 literally mercenaries that were raised in Germany and they were distributed across British British uh, infantry regiments. These are not considered Hessians. So the ones I'm talking about are these sort of complete units that are hired out by their respective um, German rulers. One thing about the term mercenary I think is also interesting because when you read um, newspaper accounts from the time period, including British criticism of the war. As you know, there are some people in Britain who are against the war in America. Why? Why? <laughs> yes, there are intelligent people everywhere. Oh. <laughs> and uh, so when you read their, when you read their accounts, uh, they're referring to soldiers that fight in America generally often as mercenary. It's, it's kind of a slur. It's like, you know, these people are not fighting, fighting kind of a noble war for a just cause. They're fighting because to oppress others. So the term is used um, for propaganda, propaganda purposes in, in different ways throughout this conflict. But yeah, one of the great things that's interesting about the revolution is, is, is I mean, there, there's a whole book to be had, probably has been written, probably several, about sort of the uses of propaganda by both sides, the constant yes. propaganda war that's going on. But I wanted to pick up, and, and eventually we'll get to what happens when the Hessians and non-Hessians get, uh, get to these shores. But I wanted to pick up on one thing you mentioned, which is that uh, it, it was also the use of these soldiers in America. Obviously, the Americans, as Chris pointed out from reading from the Declaration of Independence, made a big deal out of it. But there were people in Britain as well who uh, uh, sort of thought were kind of shocked that the British government is hiring, you know, foreigners to yes. uh, come and battle its own subjects. Yes. Oh, absolutely. It w you know, the, the opposition in Britain, which again is quite sizable, really seizes on, on this uh, and, and, and attacks in Parliament and in the press as well. Um, the King and, and Lord North and any, anyone who is in favor of this um, as, as being completely wrong-headed for a number of reasons. A, it's really expensive. I mean, that's, of course, important to keep in mind. Uh, the British rulers, what they're getting is subsidy payments and uh, huge amounts of money. So the, 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 German, the, uh, the German rulers yes, are getting Yes, yeah. they're getting a huge amount of money. So the, um, the, 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 the opposition is concerned about that. Um, the other criticism is um, about, you know, the loyalty of these Germans uh, is uh, some people question that, you know, will they be loyal uh, once they're in America? Will they really be fighting for the British? Um, considering especially that so many Germans had already settled in British North America and approximately 80,000 or so by the time of the American Revolution. 
what would happen if these soldiers went to America and saw how happy their countrymen lived and maybe they would just desert immediately and, and you know, settle and bomb them land. Um, uh, and then there's also skepticism you know, it's embarrassing, basically. The opposition argues things like, you know, how the mighty British king, you know, begging these petty, small tyrants, these rulers, they're all absolutist little rulers, and, you know, for help. I mean, how embarrassing is that, that Britain cannot take Agreed. care of its colonies itself, that it is relying on the help of these uh, decidedly, un, uh, to use a modern word, undemocratic uh, states when Britain really saw itself already as much more enlightened in terms of um, liberties and so forth. So what would happen? We're introducing all these people into, the, in, into our empire. Um, so it, it, lots of criticism uh, from it's expensive to these people are disloyal to are there, are there uh, perhaps going to hurt us more than help us once they're in America. So uh, Rodrigo, what, one of the uh, something else I found very interesting. I had always assumed that, that the princes are just taking regiments that already existed and they're sending them, but that's not the case. They're actually recruiting the, a lot of these units from scratch. So, could you tell us a little bit about you know how that process works and who is who is joining to go fight in America? Why are they doing this? <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. I think there's always there's always off that assumption that the these princes just sort of have those troops ready to go, and you just put them on transports and send them to America. And that was definitely not the case. Now they all, of course, um, had um, veterans and they had soldiers, and they they wanted to have experienced soldiers in all of these regiments. And of the officer corps or two, of course, you want experienced leaders uh, to fill these kind of positions. But to really fill the regiments, they all had to rely on raising fresh recruits. Um, we don't have drafts the way we have in a modern sense. Um, very generally speaking, these territories used kind of conscription lists. So, uh, you know, different regions, uh, regional officials had lists of young men um, that were eligible in terms of age, perhaps, and physical fitness that could potentially be recruited. Um, so they, these officials were asked to fill regiments based on, on these kind of records. Um, many men were recalled from furlough, um, men that were in garrison duty, essentially, um, that were in the military, but basically had gotten used to uh, spending maybe four weeks out of the year uh, in, in some kind of training, but the rest of the time were at home on the farm or whatever. Many of these men were recalled. Um, and then... Uh, yeah, all of these rulers had to um, go recruiting. And what they generally did is, which I think makes total sense, is you want to recruit men that, um, that were considered expendable. So in other words, very, very simply put, uh, a man whose presence in the territory was not essential for the economy, for example, or whatever, is of course more likely to be sent to America than someone who works in an essential industry or maybe a university student or someone who has, you know, takes care of a large family. Um, so there are certain men that are kind of targeted with, okay, we can live without you, but you, we'd rather keep you at home. Right. So ideally you only send expendable men. In reality, that did not, work. Um, there aren't enough men. It's also not always clear by who's, you know, someone who's expendable to the land graph may not be expendable to the local, co by, um, you know, by the local community. Yeah. So um, you have a, a mix of people that get sent abroad, including men that really um, should have stayed home uh, because of their responsibilities. I should also mention that in all of these territories, uh, some uh, people wanted men to be sent abroad. Um, for example, which I thought was really interesting, I found quite a few petitions from women yeah. who are basically, <laughs> are basically saying, hey, you know, my husband is a, is, has a drinking problem, for example. Um, he's drinking up the family income or he's fed to my daughters from my first uh -huh. marriage. Um, uh, or, or sometimes it's in-laws who saying, our son-in-law, he's basically no good, send him to America. 
So in, in some cases, that's what happened. In other cases, the, you, now your neighbors, for example, as one case, for example, where in-laws saying, send this guy to America, he's no good. Neighbors then say, no, no, wait, hey, he's the only wig maker in town. You gotta have a wig maker. Oh my God. <laughs> so things, things like that. This also, and I think this is true probably for every war. Of course, there are young men who are looking for opportunities. They're looking to advance their military careers. They don't have a lot of options at home. So for them, joining the military, going to America is an opportunity. We have some people who are essentially explorers. And they're like, I can explore North America. I've always wanted to travel, and this is a way for me to do that. Um, we have poets who have very romantic uh, sort of ideas of warfare and the quote unquote new world who's signing up as well. So it's, it's a real mix of people. But to go back to your the, the beginning, to your question, many of these men probably had never had a gun in their hands. Or rifle in their, and that, I think that's important to keep in mind. Right. This is not a professional army that is going to North America. Well, one of the great things about your book is that you have mined a lot of sources in Germany that yeah. clearly other historians, uh, perhaps because of language, have uh, not mined and not looked at. Uh, so your book's not just about the Hessians, the German soldiers, and what they did in America. It's sort of what their point of view is, what it's like for right. them, what their feelings are, what are the thoughts that they put down, etc. cetera. Uh, and here they are. They're crossing the ocean to, as you said, the, the, they're exploring, you know, join the Navy, see the world. Uh, not quite the same, but close. They're coming to North America, um, and it's really a strange place to them. And I, I'm interested in kind of what their their reactions are to this. And mm -hmm. I'll start you with a quote from your book. You said that most Hessians could not fathom why such a prosperous people would take up arms against a benevolent king. Indeed. indeed. This is for you, Chris. <laughs> indeed. Under whose watch they had done so well. So tell Precisely. us a little bit about the reactions of the, the soldiers that, that you've yeah. been able to discover upon coming to America, to the country, to the politics, to the conflict, the whole thing. Yes, yes. Yes, I think, yeah, the, the quote really captures uh, the, their, their impressions very well. Um, yeah, when they, so when they come uh, to North America, and I should mention many knew very little about North America. So it really was like a new world truly to them. And I think one, one surgeon at some point uh, when they approaching, his vessel approaches the coast of Canada, he says, we felt like Columbus, <laughs> you know, as we were sailing sort of towards the new world. So um, when they arrive, and I'm going to focus on the ones that arrive in the New York region, the first major Hessian um, uh, uh, contingents, um, their impressions were uniformly positive. They were um, um, really amazed by the uh, well, the, the richness of the land, the, the, the farmland, um, the orchards, the abundance of, of fruit trees and all the stuff you could grow there. Um, they say things like, you know, the the humblest house of a, a white inhabitant in, in like on Staten Island, for example, is nicer as the, 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 the big house of the richest Hessian in my village. So the standard of living strikes them as really impressive compared to where they are coming from. Um, uh, they, so, so, they're, so they're looking at all of this and they're, they're of course, yeah, they're confused. Like why would a nation people rise up against the ruler under whose rule they had done so well. It is generally confusing to them. I should mention that in, at the outset of the war, and I don't think that really does changes a lot over the course of the war, the majority of these troops don't have a good understanding of what the revolution is about. Um, they don't really... Um, talk much in their correspondence about politics or the reasons about the, for the rebellion. Um, what they do believe, though, is that, um, again, given that these people seem to be living so well, they have all these liberties that, you know, what else would you want? What they are beginning to assume early on is that the revolutionary <laughs> leaders that they can identify by name, people like John Hancock, for example, are selfish, 
um, selfish um, uh, committee men, as one Hessian calls them, who are manipulating the people for their own private gain. So in other words, this idea that we hear often is like sort of the citizen soldier, the American, you know, taking up arms in defense of liberty from the Hessian perspective, that makes no sense. <laughs> they have all the liberty already. So, but they're, they're fighting really because they're being deluded by a handful of politicians. One thing that over the course of the war reinforces this idea is the destruction that they see. And I think that's important to keep in mind as well. One of the first examples of destruction that the Germans witness, and they blame the American fanatics for it, is the Great Fire of New York um, shortly after their arrival. I think it was in September 76 when half of New York, well, not half, but a lot, quarter, whatever, of New York's burned to the ground. The Hessians suspect that this fire was deliberately set by American rebels, as they call them, throughout the war. And to them, that is evidence that these are deluded fanatics who are willing to destroy their own towns, habitations, farms for the sake of, uh, you know, winning this war. Um, so they're not essentially rational <laughs> people, uh, is what they assume. You know, the other thing that I, I found, well, no comment on that. Come on, no, uh, no I'm gonna, you're, you're I'm really gonna, walking the line there. You're being very I'm careful. Trying, I am. I, I am. know how hard this is for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other thing that I, I again, so many interesting little insights. But the, the other thing that I, I found fascinating was they. One of the things that shocks them is um, uh, slavery and the treatment yeah. of blacks, and that remains pretty consistent throughout their stay in North America. So, could you talk a little bit about, you know? their reaction to, to slavery and, and what they do with it. And does it change? Does it, you know? Yeah, no, that's uh, absolutely. I said, no, it does not change. They're extremely critical of, uh, uh, of um, slavery, the way they see it or encounter it in, in North America and they, and they encounter it uh, right away in New York. So that's another thing that's important to keep in mind. It's not that they don't see enslaved people until they go South. They see it everywhere in North America. Um, and in fact, when they talk about Staten Island and New York and New Jersey, New Jersey, they do, many of them say, oh, the, the, when we talk about the prosperity of the people, and we're talking about the prosperity of the white people. And one reason why they're doing so well is because they are able to essentially take advantage of the labor of black people. They are doing all the hard work. They, many uh, of these um, observers comment on that repeatedly. Um, I, it's important, I think, to keep in mind that they, uh, as far as I can tell, they don't really understand um, sl slavery as a legal institution. I don't think they have a much of a really of an understanding of what it means to be an enslaved person in, in North America. What they do know, however, is um, the uh, idea of the fact that there are maybe s servants and they are masters. And serfdom still exists in Hessian at the time. So they're very familiar with the fact that some people are serving others. That's And that is not really the problem for them. The problem for them is how uh, uh, black men, women, and children are treated by whites. Um, and so they comment extensively through, uh, about this throughout the war, um, that they, they feel that uh, black individuals are treated worse than a Hessian farmer would, would treat uh, his cattle, for example. Um, they're poorly clothed, they're, they're treated violently. Um, uh, you know, there is one story, Andreas Wiederholt, who is a Hessian in captivity at some point, he tells a story about um, a Hessian, I mean, um, a slave who was, uh, the story that he, this, the, uh, an enslaved man killed the children of his master. Um, and Andreas Wiederholt said, essentially says, it was a normal reaction. Any human would react the way this enslaved man had because the master had previously killed a child of that enslaved man. So it, the, there is, it's an extremely brutal system. It's an exploitative system. And they see it across, um, across the colonies. So um, if, there's, if there's one battle 
involving Hessians that Americans probably know about, it's the Battle of Trenton that you mentioned uh, in 1776 because George Washington crosses the Delaware, mm -hmm. very famous, launches a surprise attack on Hessians in under Colonel Rawl in Trenton and defeats them, I think, on December 26, uh, 1776. And you have a quote in your book from a London Magazine. You said, this small success, this is from London Magazine from the time, this small success wonderfully raised the spirits of the Americans. The Hessians had hitherto been very terrible to the Americans. The charm was now, however, resolved and the Hessians were no longer terrible. So how would you characterize the impact that this battle has on the War of Independence, on the Americans and on the Germans themselves? Yeah, I think uh, it definitely was a major morale boosting event <laughs> at a time when that was sorely needed. Uh, the campaign of 76 had gone quite well for the British um, and the, uh, uh, the, they went, I think, into winter quarters, including the Hessians, very with a lot of confidence that things are going quite well. There are uh, quite a few Germans who say, you know, we, we're probably going to be home, going home next year. Um, this will be over in no time. Um, and so some when mopping this... up to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, so then when this, uh, this uh, surprise attack, uh, although it wasn't a total surprise, I think, there were, I write about it a little bit in my book. I mean, I think it was surprising what George Washington ultimately decided to do, but there were some, uh, in the days leading up to it, there were warning some... Warning signs. Yeah. yeah, there was clearly warning signs, something is not going to happen. Um, so I think this this attack, which ended in the capture with more than a thousand Hessians at Trenton, and then of course the Americans follow up, up with the victories at Princeton, um, I think was a morale boosting event, as I mentioned, for the Americans, much needed. Uh, so for Washington, also Washington himself being there was in a really important battle in that regard. For the Hessians, of course, it was really pretty embarrassing. Um, it was uh, a humiliating and very disappointing development. However, um, I do want to mention that um, when you read about uh, how they talk about Trenton, this unfortunate affair, as Hessians often refer to it, um, it was uh, conven conveniently the commander had been killed, um, Johann Rall. So they blamed him for being an inept uh, leader in, in this particular situation. I should mention that Wall was uh, otherwise, uh, I think, had a very good reputation. He was well liked by his men. He was involved in the capture of Fort Washington, so he had actually a pretty good record. But he was uh, turned out to be not equipped to deal with the American attack at Trenton. So the fact that he was mortally wounded uh, allowed um, many of the officers who let her testify there was a court martial. It's not our fault. It was. It was. It was <laughs> him. It was him. Yes, and then of course it was him, and then of course it was also the weather. There was a snowstorm, and our cannon didn't, you know, fire, and that kind of thing. Um, so it, it was. It was humiliating. But I think uh, it's. It, and it. It does change the American view of the Hessians in the sense that. Um, yes, they're no longer these horrible, cruel, monstrous mercenaries, but they're in fact um, kind of pitiful almost. We need to feel sorry for them. And almost immediately, you know, when these Trenton prisoners get marched through, Wash uh, through Philadelphia, Washington instructs people to welcome them and to treat them well, because after all, they, are, they too are the, the innocent victims of tyrannical rulers. So uh, the, 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 the perspective shifts to some extent. The Hessians are, I think from the Hessian perspective, the battle that has a much more serious impact on their confidence is Red Bank, which is in the fall of 1777. Um, Trenton, you can almost write off, you know, I mean, it's a snowstorm. It's, I mean, in winter quarters, I mean, Christmas, you know, I'm yeah, certainly. you know, I mean, come on, you know, right? uh, overwhelming American. I mean, you know, there are all these, you Crazy. can rationalize it almost, but uh, then fast forward to October 77 and you have Red Bank where an uh, almost exclusively German force attacks this relatively small stronghold in New Jersey, which ends in total disaster. 
that's a much more devastating experience in terms of their confidence. And then on top of that, October 77 coincides with Saratoga, Saratoga. Yeah. and then the French will soon enter the war. So uh, I think, to, from my perspective, Red Bank is one of the underrated, <laughs> underappreciated battles that involves the Hessians. Uh, but yes, but of course, Trenton is important. Uh, Washington is there, and it does, uh, it does bolster American morale for sure. So, Federica, I, you know, I, I think I had no idea really until I read the book, and most Americans don't. But the the Hessian participation is massive. I mean, I'm picking up yeah. on what you, we suck. We always think about Trenton. You mentioned Red Bank, but there are thirty thousand Hessians deployed, and it's safe to say from 1776 till the end of the war, just about every engagement there are Hessians present. How important is this contingent to Britain's ability to wage war? and to their war effort? I, I, it's been estimated that uh, uh, approximately a third of the British regular army strength was German, uh, you know, by, by 1780-81. So I think there's a historian, Stephen Conway, who's written a lot about this. And I think uh, that uh, that alone is substantial. I think it allowed Britain to fight this war for as long as they did. Uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, I think... Um, I, I think they gave uh, the, the presence, uh, the participation of these these troops gave gave Britain a chance to actually potentially win this. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing that that Chris, uh, just listening to your question and responding, it it you know it it also it reduces the casualty rolls that come right. back to London and Greenwich and Birmingham and you know, wherever in England. So, you know, you can, you can, in a way, it, it allows the, I suppose it allows the government to kind of continue going along. Whereas if, if you had one third more casualties, it would be that much harder to convince your citizens to keep going. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and what were the, what was the impression of, we know obviously that the Americans were a little disdainful, so I would say of the Hessians when they arrived. What was the impression of their British comrades in arms to this German force? Were they favorable? Did they work well together? Was it adversarial? Uh, that, that's a really good question. I, I didn't go that much into British records, uh, just, you know, soldiers commenting on the, the presence of Germans in, you know, their fight. They're always fight, often fight side by side. Um, there is some evidence, at least in the, in the German parts, that there is there's some... Uh, uh, there is some tension, some resentment, especially amongst German officers, because um, although the German units were commanded by German officers and their German generals and all that, um, the highest ranking officer was always a British, with one or two exceptions. Um, and then when they were had to uh, serve together, there's the language barrier. I think that's probably the biggest issue that really bothers some of these uh, officers who will be very, very frustrated with, um, you know, their inability to understand British commands. They feel like often when, we, when the men are exercised together, uh, it's it's using British commands and, and British drum rolls or whatever, and so the um, Germans are often frustrated with the inability to understand uh, what's being said. Um, and that in the, that in turn uh, they feel um, hinders their uh, chances of, of advancement um, and and so forth. Um, so there is there is some there's you know I think there's more more tension between the Hessians and loyalists mm -hmm. who are recruited in America partly because they're always very suspicious of their loyalty. Uh, their loyalty, yeah. yeah. Um, I think that's a more of a concern for them, um, fighting alongside loyalists and also fighting alongside Native Americans, which is another yeah. community that they're ambivalent about. Yeah. Uh, you, we have a, a, a lot of questions from the audience that revolve around the same point, which is um, at the end of the war, um, are, um, uh, how many of the Hessians, the German soldiers, end up uh, staying in America after the war, were they invited to stay? Did, did many of them want to stay? Is it a very small percentage? I've got three or four different variations uh, on this question. Uh, and so maybe you could, I know you touched on that in the book, maybe you could touch on that now. 
So I um, can give you some quick numbers. So we are estimating again that maybe 30,000 or so soldiers, probably actually more, but so let's say 30,000 uh, served in America over the course of the war. Around 7,500 or so died um, in doing the war in America, 1,200 of those in battle. So as, as was always the case, this in case in the 18th century wars, the greatest killer is disease. Most of them die of disease. So 23,000 or so survived. Of those, we estimate that maybe five or 6,000 decided to stay in, de, de, stayed in North America. Um, either they left already during the war or um, during, in 1783 when the Corps was getting ready to evacuate. At least half of them actually went to Canada. So Britain offered land grants to uh, soldiers who decided to settle in provinces like Nova Scotia and Quebec and other places. And a, a couple of thousands Germans took them up on this offer. Keep in mind that several thousand Germans spent the entire war in Canada. Uh, also something we tend to forget. Um, not all German soldiers went with Burgoyne in 76 to Saratoga and were captured. A couple of thousand stayed behind and they were replenished with new troops for the remainder of the war. So some of these, in other words, had lived there already for a while and they just decided to stay. But then there may be 2,500 or so that stayed in uh, what is what then became the United States. Um, during the war, the Americans offered land and liberty and usually also a couple of farm animals to any German soldiers, soldier who deserted. And there's certainly some who took took them up on that offer. Uh, not as many as the Americans, I think, would have hoped. But then when the war is over, especially after Yorktown, when things are winding down, and when we still have several thousand uh, German troops uh, uh, in captivity, uh, they're prisoners of war. When they are learning that the war is coming to an end and they're getting ready to be sent back to, to uh, Germany, some of them decide just not to report back to New York or wherever they're asked to, to report back to. They're officially considered deserters, um, but it doesn't look like the officials or the officers made a lot of, um, you know, tried very hard to retrieve them. All of the, one thing I just want to mention here, all of, uh, or at least not all of them, but several of the, these subsidy treaties included clauses that prohibited soldiers to remain in America without permission. The treaties so, that the German principalities signed with England yes. to supply the soldiers to them. Yes, because there was some concern that, hey, you know, some, some of these Germans might think, hey, free passage to America. Right. <laughs> so they were actually, and also the German, all of the German rulers are very concerned about depopulating, especially the countryside, you know, and sending too many young men abroad. So we, we basically want them back. Um, so, uh, not everyone who wanted to stay in America got to stay in America. I think that's important to keep in mind. At the same time, not everyone who wanted to return to Germany got to return to Germany because especially men who had been injured perhaps or who had been uh, gotten into trouble, had some sort of infraction during military service um, in some in, in some cases were to be denied return passes to Germany because they were considered to be essentially burdens once they returned. So we have some people who probably stayed here who would have preferred to go back. Um, but yeah, 2,500 to 3,000 or so, from all we can, my book, that would have been probably volume two to figure out what happened to them. Right. Um, but from what we can tell, I think they were, welcomed into their settled in predominantly German American communities, Maryland, Pennsylvania, places like that. Again, some had been prisoners of war in some of these places. They married American women. From what I can tell, they were not uh, treated with any kind of hostility when they decided to, to stay behind. Yeah, I, I, you know, we're going to we're going to give Chris Anderson one more question. And then we're just going to get rid of the show. We, we, we should tell people before they think that he's left in a huff. 
<laughs> that he's trying to catch an airplane because for whatever reason he doesn't want to stay in New Orleans. He wants to go back to his oh, home London. in London uh, under the tutelage of the king and his uh, most magnificent Majesty Charles. And yes. you know, be eating his fish and chips and doing all the that English stuff oh. that they do in England. And so, Chris, ask your question, and then you made. I don't know if I've never tried to handle this show by myself. I, you're in good. I am. I am petrified but you know what we're gonna let you ask your question and then let you go so frederick one of the things again because all these little insights that are just really compelling in the book but given what we talked about earlier that you know i didn't know this but these units were largely recruited for the war so in a way you could say that they're kind of a, like a it's not a citizen army but they're they're not professional in the sense that they are used to being sent no. away right mm -hmm. so if you take thirty thousand young men out of what are arguably pretty small communities in Germany and send them away. What is the impact of this movement of people on these communities? Are they following the war? Do they suffer? Do they gain economically? What is what's happening back home? Yeah. So oh, there's the different ways to uh, answer this. Uh, one very general consequence of all of this is that uh, German-speaking Europeans are learning a lot more about North America than ever before. Um, so that's a, one immediate res response, essentially. Suddenly, all these Germans are going to North America. Suddenly, periodicals are beginning to report about what's happening. Soldiers are also writing letters and accounts um, for public consumptions. In other words, they're sent back home during the war to be published, in, sometimes in serialized uh, form. So people learning more about North America. So that's one immediate consequence. Now, the communities themselves, many of them really uh, are hit uh, hard uh, by the departure of uh, so many men or essentially, in many cases, breadwinners. Uh, and I've come across uh, thick files of, of uh, letters, petitions, um, reports from individuals, family members, but also local officials who are basically saying, here is this 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 woman with her three children, the man was, was sent abroad, and here is the father who had relied on his son, his only son, for, to, to run the mill or whatever. Here is this, this mother who can no longer, you know, keep up the shop. So there is definitely a real economic hardship for many of these families. The rulers uh, tried to help by offering things like firewood, for example, or relieving them of some of the, what we call tax burdens. Um, uh, but there's definitely, um, there's definitely economic hardship. At the same time, the recruitment of the, all these troops, they all needed stuff. They need uniforms. They need, uh, you know, an incredible amount of, of things that needed to be manufactured and sold and transported. So there are also a lot of people throughout the empire who are benefiting from all of this because they are, it's a bit more, as you know, good business for some people. Yeah. Mm. Um, so there is that side to it as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Frederick, buy the book, everybody. It's wonderful. Thank you so Thank much. You, good luck. Thank you. Goodbye, Chris. Uh, Everybody else, please stay. Yeah, please stay. <laughs> I'll stay. Good. Well, I'm glad that you'll stay because if I'm talking all by myself, it's going to be terribly problematic and uh, we don't really want to have that happen. There's so much to ask you about um, and we have more questions coming in, but I would like to ask you to tell us a little bit about one of my favorite characters of the American uh, Revolution, someone you share a name with, uh, Baroness Redazel, oh. uh, oh. Frederica Redazel. She she is uh, married to a German officer. Uh, she makes this amazing journey to the United States. She is determined to get to the United States to be, right. which isn't the United States yet. Of course, she's not. Germany isn't Germany yet. And the United States isn't the United States yet. But to be with her husband. And so she ends up being, uh, he, and he is the commander of the Brunschweiger Jaeger. Uh, and uh, so she ends up being at the Battle of Saratoga because her husband is serving under General Burgoyne. And, and she, she leaves an amazing diary. So tell us a little bit about her. Yeah, so she is this woman who, uh, the, when her husband, Adolf, gets the call to go, he's actually the commander of all the Braunschweig, the entire Braunschweig Corps, 
for him, this is an incredible career opportunity. The war, like for many other many officers, like there's war, so we can advance our careers. And so he goes to North America, and she in uh, back in Wolfenbüttel immediately decides to go uh, follow him. She can't, for various reasons, go literally with them. There's a delay. To make a long story short, she does eventually catch up with them in Canada. She has three young daughters at the time. Uh, she was pregnant when he left. That's one right. reason why she Right, she was having a baby, so she couldn't make a transatlantic yeah. journey. Yeah, so she has these three very young, like one, three, and four, something like that. Um, and she arrives in Canada and, uh, and yes, and follows her husband to Saratoga and she watches, is witnesses essentially the battles um, she sees uh, in, her, in, her, in the house where she's staying with some other wives of other officers and um, children. Um, she's, they bring, throughout the battle, they bring in injured uh, officers, including one who essentially dies on, on her dining room table. Um, so it's a very moving description of, of, of the, really also the violence of, of, of this war. And, and then she ends up being a, 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 going into captivity uh, with the, the so-called Convention Army. Um, she spends some time in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and then the, and the Convention Army, as some of you will know, is moved to Virginia, where she's in Charlottesville. And she befriends uh, Jefferson and other prominent Americans. She meets the Marquis de Lafayette at some point. Um, so she is a very interesting woman who is uh, really, uh, quite honestly, enjoying an opportunity for her, for, for you know, this opportunity to see uh, a world that is very different from hers as, you know, a, sort of an upper class German housewife mother and probably had limited opportunities to, to get out and do things like that. So she takes full advantage um, and, to, and she spends the entire war in, uh, in North America, writes about eating bear meat, for example, and um, describes uh, Native Americans that she, she's seeking out. She wants to meet Native Americans and talks about that. She has two more daughters in North America. One is called America and the other one is called Canada. <laughs> Uh, yeah. uh, Canada dies in infancy, but mm. the America survives to adulthood. When they go, when they're back in Europe, she has two more children. One is called George, and one is called Charlotte, after the after British the king, king queen. queen yeah. So uh, she definitely is very moved by what she sees. Um, she considered it her tour of duty, her Berufsreise is the German word for it. And her, her, her account has been translated into English. It's a very good translation. Uh, so I recommend it if you get your hands on it. It's very unique. It's the only known account by a woman who accompanied the German Corps to North America. Well, uh, as you know, both Chris and I lead tours for Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours. Mm -hmm. And I do Revolutionary War tours. And one of them is the Boston to Quebec Revolutionary War Tour. We'll do another ad for it. It's coming up in... Um, uh, next summer, uh, at the end of next summer. And uh, when we're in Saratoga, we go to the house, the Marshall House, now known, where okay. she was staying, where the where the uh, British officer was, was killed on her uh, dining room table while he was being operated on. Another cannonball came in and, and, uh, and hit him. And we, we go down, it's a private home, but the owner takes us mm -hmm. down into the basement where she was, you know, huddled with her children to hide from the mm -hmm. cannonade. And I they read excerpts from her diary and her journal and she is she's a uh, pretty amazing do we know what is do you know what the title of her uh, account is we have somebody asking about that uh like the book is it um i mean redazel is r spell redazel that'll help everybody r i e r yeah r i e d e s e l baroness frederica Right. Redazel. So you should be able to find it, guys. You'll um, find it. And there's uh, bunches of it online, too. I've been able to find large amounts of it online uh, as well. Quite well. She's quite well known. And, and, and she, uh, years after they returned to Germany, their correspondent with Jefferson, Philip Schuyler, took him in after, so it, it's really an interesting right. it's a, story a, connected to many different Americans and also French officers. Um, I want to bring up a question that uh, uh, Skip Cornett put a question up here 
uh, you know, there were obviously Germans in America, as you mentioned, about 80,000 of them. What kind of relations did they have with the uh, uh, Hessian soldiers, the Germans who came in in the war? Yeah, good, great question. Um, so the, uh, Hes the, the, the German soldiers that spent time in places like Northern Maryland and also Pennsylvania um, generally uh, described it as in very favorable terms. They liked the fact that it was quite German. They liked the fact that they could eat German food and the, the, the farms looked German to them. And in German town, Pennsylvania, there was actually a German language newspaper at the time, which they used. Um, the German Americans did not weren't quite as excited to see them. <laughs> Um, they were very, obvious, for obvious reasons, very ambivalent, and in my, I write about it in my book. Um, the German, German American, the German, they, they would literally sometimes confronted uh, the, those the officers said like, "What are you doing here? Why do, why have you come to fight a war against us? You know, uh, we're what you have nothing to do with our struggle. What you know? What are you? Why are you doing this?" Um, so the German Americans generally um, are very critical uh, towards the presence of the German soldiers. Now, um, many German Americans are not necessarily fervent patriots. Uh, they may they're more more probably better described as neutral. But I think no matter what your political persuasion. Uh, your soldiers in your in your neighborhood or in your town is usually not welcome. So I think that even even um, soldiers that were um, not necessarily ardent patriots or revolutionaries uh, were very critical of the presence of German soldiers fighting for the British in 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 North America. So it, the relationships, in other words, it, overall were tense. Now. That being said, we also know that quite a few of the German soldiers, especially the ones that spent extensive extended periods of time as prisoners in places like Reading and Lancaster, ultimately worked for local German families, German American families, and some also married German American women. So on a kind of individual basis, um, I think they're, they, they're, they were able to talk to each other. They understood each other in some ways. So on a case-by-case on a -case basis, I think um, they, they, were, they, they seemed to have gotten along. Well, it's a, it's, it's a fascinating and very textured story. And, um, you know, when I'm leading Revolutionary War tours, one of the messages that I always have for people is that, you know, you have this simple image of it's red coat versus rebel. And it's so mm. much more complicated. Not you know, so you've got you. the Hessians, you have Native Americans on both sides, you have African Americans fighting on both sides, you have patriot militia, you have loyalist militia. So the whole Spanish, 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 Spanish <laughs> French, we, we have to go on and have a, another show talk about that. But the diversity of all that, I think people really yeah. have no idea. And as we approach the mm -hmm. 250th anniversary of the revolution, I think it's great to be telling these stories. And you have done such a wonderful job telling the story of the, the Hessians in America. And uh, Frederica Baer's book is Hessians, German Soldiers in the American Revolutionary War. Both Chris Anderson, who has deserted us, uh, if you joined late, <laughs> because he had to break an airplane, um, uh, really have enjoyed this book and enjoyed talking to you. Thank you so much for writing this, for putting it out there, and for telling this story. And we look forward to whatever stories you're going to tell next. Thank you so much, Rick. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. Appreciate well, thank, it. Thank you so much. So that was our interview with Frederica Baer. And um, and now we have had two weeks in a row, Chris, of Revolutionary War. So we're going to get back. Uh, 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 American War of Independence. Okay. Okay. We have to get back to a war where we agree on the names of the war <laughs> and the teams that were on the same the teams, team. The teams. The teams. I don't want to be on a different team than you. It's uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, and next week, we're going to do that. We're going to be uh, back live. We're going to be back in World War II. Whew. And we're going to be talking to uh, Halik Kachansky, who is the yes. author of uh, the book Resistance, The Underground War Against Hitler, 1939, 1945. And you're familiar with uh, Halik's work, Chris, and you're a yeah. fan, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fanboy because her book about uh, Poland and World War II is absolutely fantastic. And it's one I use every year to prepare for the Poland trip. So a bit of a fanboy. And also this trip 
the site inspection I'm doing on Operation Dragoon, whole lot of resistance stuff. Um, so uh, really excited to revisit. That'll that give you a new perspective yeah. for, for that show. Yeah. And uh, and Max Hastings, who we frequently quote, but who has never appeared on History Happy Hour. <laughs> it's on his list, though. Uh, uh, wrote that this is the most comprehensive and best account of resistance I have read. So really looking forward. We had this Absolutely. show scheduled in May. She, she got ill. She couldn't do it. Really looking forward to doing this uh, this week. Absolutely. So please, guys, subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow please. us on Facebook. Please. 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 <laughs> Shout at us on Twitter. Shout. Uh, listen to our podcast, back us on Patreon, and browse historyhappyhour.com. Yes, please do that and be safe.